Hello you knaves, welcome to Shakespeare Academy. If you want a good job or you want a good partner for a date, you need to know how to persuade people. Literature is about human relations and rhetoric is a way of thinking about how words can influence people, how words can generate thoughts and emotions in others. Our favourite Greek philosopher Aristotle gave a pretty good definition of rhetoric, discerning the possible means of persuasion in any context. This is a good starting definition because it not only highlights what is persuasive, but why it is persuasive. I won't go into everything Aristotle said on the topic, but he introduced a famous and helpful division of the three types of persuasive arguments. They are ethos, the argument from authority, arguing why the speaker should be heard. Logos, the argument from reason, the logical steps, the facts, arguing why the speaker is right. And pathos, the argument from emotion, the passions the speaker stirs in the audience and why it matters the speaker is right. There's a great example of persuasive rhetoric in Shakespeare's play Henry V. We are in Act 3, Scene 3. King Henry himself is before the walls of Harfleur in France. He's trying to persuade the citizens to surrender the city. Bonjour, you cheese-eating surrender monkeys! before he makes a final attack. How yet resolves the governor of the town. This is the latest pile we will admit. Therefore, to our best mercy, give yourselves. Or, like to men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For as I am a soldier. The first part of the speech is a fairly simple logos argument. Surrender or die. This is a cause and effect argument. If you do X, then Y will happen. Though there is a little bit of pathos when King Henry calls the men of Harfleur proud of destruction. In the last line though, after talking about Al, Henry turns to himself and his ethos. Why this sudden change? Is this a boast? Is he responding to a French reaction? Is he trying to prove his strength and bravery to himself? Let's see how he continues. As I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts becomes me best. If I begin the battery once again, I will not leave the half-achieved Harfleur till in her ashes she lie buried. Henry repeats the threat, if you don't surrender, I will destroy the town, but emphasises his own agency and violence. Perhaps here he's trying to rid himself of the reputation he has as a young hedonist. He goes on. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up, and the fleshed soldier, rough and hard of heart, in the liberty of bloody hand shall range, with conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass, your fresh fair virgins and your flowering infants. This is a vivid, disturbing picture of what will happen. This is all pathos now. That simile in the last line and a half, mowing like grass, is horrifying. As Henry has moved from Logos to Pathos, he has also moved from first person to third person. Henry won't be doing this, but the fleshed soldier, rough and hard of heart, he continues this thought. What is it then to me, if impious war, arrayed in flames like to the prince of fiends, do with his smirched complexion all fell feats and linked to waste and desolation? Now Henry has completely removed himself from the destruction. It is an abstract but personified war that will do all fell feats. Why does Henry move from his personal role as a soldier to something completely removed from himself? Why does Henry repeat these threats? Who is he trying to persuade? The men of Harfleur? His own soldiers? Himself? The last option might fit with Henry's distancing himself from these horrid acts. He doesn't want the responsibility. It is not Henry, it is war that does these things. It is war that ruins Harfleur. What is't to me when you yourselves are cause, if your pure maidens fall into the hand of hot and forcing violation? While still keeping the pathos, Henry returns to the Logos and blames the French for the expected English violation of their young girls. The Oxford English Dictionary shows us that this disturbing meaning of the word violation was probably more recognisable in the past than it is today. And Shakespeare emphasises the point by giving the word five syllables in the line. Henry goes on. What rain can hold licentious wickedness when down the hill he holds his fierce career? We may as bootless spend our vain command upon the enraged soldiers in their spoil, as send precepts to the Leviathan to come ashore. What can prevent the abstract licentious wickedness? According to Henry, nothing. We might as well instruct the Leviathan to come ashore. Therefore, you men of Harfleur, take pity of your town and of your people, 
Whilst yet my soldiers are in my command, Whilst yet the cool and temperate winds of grace Er blows the filthy and contagious clouds Of heady murder, spoil, and villainy. Henry seems to be a bit worried here. He's saying he won't be able to control his rapacious soldiers for much longer. The parallelism, cool and temperate, and filthy and contagious, confirm Henry's composure here. But then he returns to his disturbing prophecies of what's to come if the French don't surrender the town. If not, why in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill shrieking daughters? Your fathers taken by the silver beards, and their most reverent heads dashed to the walls. Your naked infants spitted upon pikes, while the mad mothers with their howls confused do break the clouds, as did the wives of Jewry at Herod's bloody hunting slaughtermen. The imagery and the allusions here are all important. In this passage, Henry compares himself to Herod. Herod I, also known as Herod the Great, was a client king of Judea under the Roman Empire. In the second chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, Herod, in an attempt to kill the infant Jesus, orders the slaughter of all the boys under the age of two in the village of Bethlehem and the surrounding area. The event is known as the Massacre of the Innocents. So is Henry admitting that he, like Herod, will kill innocent infants? This is especially important because the prologue at the start of the second act called Henry the mirror, the paragon, the prime example of all Christian kings. The speech ends with a decisive heroic couplet and Henry gives the French two options. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid? Or guilty in defense be thus destroyed? The French yield. Henry's arguments and emotional appeals worked. Henry and his English soldiers take the town of Harfleur. There's a splendid irony in all of this. All these great words, all these frighteningly vivid images for an imperialist land grab which did not long survive Henry's death, as Shakespeare and his audience knew full well. Why then do we like this play? Why do we like these speeches so much? The great essayist William Hazlitt tells us, he, Henry V, was a hero, that is, he was ready to sacrifice his own life for the pleasure of destroying thousands of other lives. How then do we like him? We like him in the play. There he is a very amiable monster, a very splendid pageant. In his magnificent rhetoric, Henry the amiable monster almost sways us, almost gets us to follow his thinking. Were you persuaded? Would you have surrendered Harfleur? Let me know in the comments.